you have your Bibles, do stick to Luke chapter 19. Traditionally, today is a special Sunday. It is known as Palm Sunday. And actually, on the way here this morning, uh, we drove past uh, one church and they had all the children carrying these palm uh, branches and palm leaves. And it is the Sunday, or back in the Bible days, it was known as the first day of the week, uh, which our Lord sat on a donkey and entered the great city, Jerusalem. And five days later, he was to be arrested and crucified. So from today, we are following Jesus to the cross, uh, starting with today being Palm Sunday, and then we will meet on Good Friday, 11 o'clock, for, uh, for the arrest and betrayal, and then Resurrection Sunday for our usual service at 10.45. This passage in Luke contains the first event in Christ's final week, the event known as the triumphal entry. That's probably the heading in your Bible as well, the triumphal entry. But as we will see, it is anything but triumph. A triumphal entry would be what Jesus, uh, sorry, what the Jews were looking for. A triumphal entry would have included uh, Jesus de defeating Satan and overthrowing the Roman uh, domination of Israel. A triumphal entry would have had Jesus set up as king and ruler and judge because that is what they expected. Queen Victoria at her coronation, she was given a crown that was so encrusted with a giant uh, with giant rubies and a giant sapphire surrounding a diamond that was 309 carats. Everything that could be bought to bear on the woman for that coronation was done. It was grand. It was huge. Well, nothing like that was seen here in the earthly coronation of Jesus. No uh, formalities, no juries, no dignitaries or no robes, no musicians. His coronation was indeed humble coronation. It was very much like his birth. His birth was in a stable. His coronation was riding on a donkey. His birth was attended by shepherds who in social terms were the lowest people on the social ladder. His coronation was all the lowly people and rejected, and he was rejected by the religious nobility. But can I just remind us that he is the true king. As the people recite in verse 38 of Luke 19, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And that's our theme this morning. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And so they were right to worship him. Because he's God's true king. And all, um, all the coronations that have ever been held in the world's history to own a monarch. No monarch even comes close to what Jesus deserves by way of honor. There's never been one so supreme, so magnificent, so majestic, and so powerful, and so sovereign, so worthy, so glorious as King Jesus. You can add up all the kings who have ever crowned, who have ever been crowned in history. None of them, none of them 
compare to King Jesus. This is why I love preaching. Because preaching is hallowing the king's message, it's declaring the king's message. That's why, saints, when we teach and preach, or even in evangelism, when we speak the things of God, when we share the gospel, in a sense, we are declaring the message of the true king. He will be back. And at the second coronation, he will be glorious and not humble. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And he won't be riding a donkey, but a great stallion. He will rule with an iron scepter. And he will bear the name King of Kings. Lord of Lords, Revelation 19, verse 11. So the first thing I want to point out here is that this was a Passover season where all the Jews are celebrating Passover and so everyone is going into Jerusalem. Thousands and hundreds by hundreds are heading towards Jerusalem to celebrate this massive feast of Passover. And so he is in a large crowd of pilgrims. Thousands of people are descending into Jerusalem. All the rabbis and the Pharisees, all the religious leaders of the day, they were there with their followers. And so Jesus, he too, is making his way with his followers. And it just happened to be that he's got the largest following, of course, after all. For three years, he has banished illness from the land. He has done miracle after miracle and taught like no other person who has ever lived. He also miraculously brought salvation to the life of, the, of a chief tax collector named Zacchaeus who was the most hated man in Jericho because he was a tax collector. He collected tax from the Jews to give to the Romans. A few weeks before this, he raised from the dead a well-known man by the name of Lazarus in the village of Bethany, which is at the top of the hill about two miles east of Jerusalem on the way to Jericho. So the crowd around him is big. It is huge and it's getting bigger. What he did in Jericho and raising uh, Lazarus from the dead added to the size of the crowd. People wanted to see the man who works miracles. They wanted to see the man who raises people from the dead. They wanted to see the man who says, go, your sins have been forgiven. So these people had an expectation. And this is an important point to remember. The people had expectations. They were hopeful that he would display my, um, my sonic power and bring the glory of kingdom promised to Israel, like in the Old Testament. But the truth was, the truth was, he was headed to the cross. He told his disciples that, but it didn't commute. They didn't receive. It didn't register. So he proceeds on his way up to the mountain of Jerusalem to face the unbelievable horrors of death on a cross as God's chosen sacrifice for sin. He comes to die and then to rise, not only conquering sin, but conquering death for all who would believe 
and then to ascend into heaven and leave the gates of heaven wide open for all who would believe in him. He comes to die and later he comes to reign. And so in the meantime, we all have had the opportunity to embrace him as a savior and then one day to share in his kingdom he will bring in the next time he returns. And so the second thing to point out here, after pointing out that this was Passover week, is that up to this time, up to this point, Jesus had never allowed this kind of open public display. He was always the Messiah, yes. He was, he was always the king. He's always been the king, yes. He uh, always demonstrated his deity, yes. He was always showing that he was God, yes. And there's no doubt that he put his deity on display constantly. But at any point in time, it, it would been have right, it, it would been right to worship him, to exhort him. It would been right to give him that massive display of celebration as glorious person, as the son of God, as he is, the Messiah. But he never allowed it. Every time people wanted to worship him or every time somebody wanted to praise him, he never allowed it. In fact, if, uh, if it ever began, he stopped it. This is, uh, but this is the only time this is the only time that he's allowing a, such a public worship of himself. Why? Because this is God's time. From the very beginning of his ministry, the religious leaders were intimidated by him. Uh, it didn't take a long time until they hated him and they wanted to uh, get rid of him. Very early in his life, they wanted him dead. So he never publicly allowed the worship of himself that could have accelerated his murder, if you will. So the public display must have happened now and only now. At the greatest possible level, the exposure of interest in him must reach to threaten his enemies, to cause them to excrete the efforts to have him dead. This is all happening in God's time. And so Jesus knows exactly what is happening. So as we begin to look at the text, I have broken it into three sections. Verse 28 to 34, we will see that the true king knows all things. Verse 35 to 40, we will see that the king is worshipped. And then verse 41 to 44, we will see that the king weeps for his people. So that's our three points this morning. The true king knows all things, point one. The king is praised, point two. And the king weeps for his people, point three. So let me read Luke chapter 19, verse 28 to uh, 32. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and, and as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there, which no one has ever ridden. And tie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the coat, his owners asked them, why are you untying the coat? They replied, the Lord needs it. It's interesting because the Bible is so humble here in how it introduces these staggering indications of the supernatural knowledge of Christ. How does he know this? 
if you if you are struggling with the idea that God is all knowing here's the proof in the pudding go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it you will find a coat tied there which no one has ever ridden this is one little fall of a donkey that's never been broken never been ridden as if it had been created just for this one purpose for one rider the all glorious and yet humble jesus so not only does he know that there is a donkey and that no one has ever ridden it, but he also knows that there will be people who will ask, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. We are talking about a tiny little area here. We are talking about this little village of Bethany and this tiny little village of Bethany uh, very nearby and masses of Jewish people are there from everywhere to see Jesus and to see Lazarus because he was raised from the dead. Everybody would, would know the, the word was everywhere that Jesus was in town. He had raised Lazarus from the dead and now the one who had done that had done all the miracles. He was there. He's staying with Mary and Martha in Bethany. He is the Lord. He is called the Lord by those who love him and believe in him. So when he says, you go into the village, you find the animal. When they ask, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord has need of it. You won't have no problem. You won't have no problem. The pitch has been elevated to the point now where everybody is anticipating this. He is the great, this is his great moment. They know he's a miracle worker. They know he heals people. They know he raises uh, uh, the dead. They know he casts out demons. He has power over the world. He has power over diseases. He has power over the spirit. And he has the truth of God and he proclaims it like no one who has ever lived. And so when you say the Lord needs it, nothing will be asked. Nothing will be questioned. So they did what they were told. Verse 32, those who were sent away, went away, found it just like as he had told them. They found it exactly as he had told them. And this must have been staggering for them. Just like he said, there it is, there is the donkey, immediately in the village. And they started untying it just the way Jesus said. Verse 33 points out that they were untying the coat. And the owner said to them, why are you untying it? Just like Jesus had predicted and they said, the Lord needs of it. And the owners of the donkey were probably amazed, more than anything, they were probably amazed that the Lord would choose their donkey. Now, what we need to understand here then is that being on a donkey, yes, it was a humble thing, but in the biblical world, for 2,000 years, it, it also had been a very common thing for kings and rulers and judges to ride on a donkey. A donkey was not considered, you know, if, 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 at the moment, if a great uh, military hero showed up in town riding on a donkey, we would think something was wrong. But not here. That would not have occurred to them as being wrong. There are examples of this in the Old Testament where judges and rulers and kings rode on a donkey. So it was considered perfectly appropriate. The donkey was a royal animal. And so Jesus is making a claim to kingship by riding this donkey. And it's clear that the crowd gets it. So they cry out, behold, you are king 
sorry, they cry, Behold, your king is coming to Zion. And the crowd would say, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So it's clear that the crowds get it. They understand the symbolism. They understand what Jesus is proclaiming. For he is claiming to be king. It is not recorded here, but in, in Luke, uh, it is recorded that it was prophesied 500 years earlier by Zacharias. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, uh, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the fall of a donkey. So 500 years earlier, the prophet Zechariah said he would come riding a donkey's coat. And he knew that. Jesus knew this prophecy very well. And he knew that this was the plan. He knew exactly which donkey, where it was, and how to acquire it. Because the true king knows all things. Because he is all-knowing. And so Matthew tells us uh, that this is a fulfillment of Zechariah. John, in his account, he also tells us the same thing, that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah, that Jesus would come riding on a donkey. Now we come to the second section, the king is worshipped, verse 35 to 40, the king is worshipped. Luke 19, verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the cord, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and, and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So by this, Jesus is vindicated as the Messiah by receiving worship that which belongs only to God. Sometimes people say, well, you know, Jesus was a godly man. Jesus was a righteous man. Jesus was a good man. And that's it. He was just a good man, a, a godly man, a good teacher, and no more. And if he was just that, he would not receive worship. If he was a good man, he would not receive worship. He would not allow it. Those who allow it are rather crazy or fake. That's not for good people or wise people. Anyone who is wise enough, they would not allow to be worshipped. Unless they're frauds. And so this uh, verse 36, as he went along, people sprayed their cloaks on the road. This was an old custom, an ancient custom. You read it in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 13. We read uh, this. Um, they quickly took the cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. Jehu is king. And so it symbolizes submission. When, when they would take off their clothes and throw them underneath, it symbolizes submission. They were in effect saying, we place ourselves under your feet. Somebody sent me a video clip, uh, one of those African prophets, and uh, he arrives at church, he gets out the car, and everyone lies down flat like this and he's walking on top of them 
until he arrives in the church on a red carpet. He's a fake. He's a phony. But these folk, throwing their coats under the animal, they, they were showing their submission to the true king. And Jesus allowed it. He didn't stop it. Let me just ask at this point, are you submitting to his kingship? Are we submitting to his lordship? Or are you the king of your own life? You see, the big, bigger concept of submission is to place oneself under the authority of another. When we submit to God, we give our lives to his authority and his control. That is what it means to be a disciple. If you are to say you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus, it means you have submitted to his authority. Have you allowed him to be in control? Have you allowed Jesus to be in charge of your life? And in our text, the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, verse 39, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Rebuke your disciples. That's because they could not believe what they were witnessing. In their eyes, this Jesus, this good teacher, was accepting their worship and praise. This is as bad as blasphemy. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. No man should allow his followers to worship him as though he is God. Teacher, tell them to stop it. Why are you allowing them to worship you? Why are you allowing them to praise you? So the true king, the God king, is worshipped. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what they shouted out. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're using other language, basically from the Psalms. Matthew adds this in his account. At this moment, Matthew 21 verse 8, most of the multitude spread their garments on the road. Most of them, others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And John, uh, he adds 12 verse 13, says he says, they were palm branches because palm branches were a symbol of joy. This was a celebration to end all celebrations. The joy was at a high pitch. They were throwing their cloaks down. They were cutting branches. They are throwing branches at his feet. Symbol of a joy. And again, Matthew adds that they said, Hosanna to the son of David. And that's the common uh, references used to, to the Messiah, son of David. Because in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the promise was that David would have greater son, who would have an everlasting and glorious kingdom and fulfill all the promises that have been given. So they called Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. And Matthew uses the word Hosanna, which means save now. And they weren't talking about spiritual salvation. That was the problem. They were not talking about spiritual salvation from sin. When they shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now. They were talking about being saved from the nation from the Romans. Save us from our desperate condition in this world. Save us and bring the fulfillment of the promises. And so they are borrowing this language from Psalm 118, verse 26. 
sometimes called the sum of salvation. Uh, some scholars call it the conquering sum, and sometimes it's called the coronation sum. Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, from the house of the Lord, we bless you. Mark chapter 11, verse 10 says that in the crowd they were saying, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the coming king. They thought this was it. This is the Old Testament promised kingdom. The kingdom is coming to fruition. This is it. This is our time. But it wasn't. The king had come to die. He had come to die. And then Zechariah said in Zechariah 12, Someday they will look on him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as an only son. And then they will be cleansed and then they will come the kingdom. But first he had to be pierced for their sins. So the Pharisees were outraged. Back to the Pharisees. This is blasphemy, they said. This is blasphemy. They thought that this the worship of the people, because in, in, in the worship, the people were connecting Jesus with God. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Put a stop to it. They shouldn't be doing this. You remember when the crowd worshipped Paul and his companion. Paul stopped them. Paul said, No. Do not worship us. We're just men. But Jesus said this. I tell you, if these become quiet, the stones will cry out. So he vindicates himself as the Messiah in preparation. The all-knowing, the king of all kings, the God of man, the one who possesses the authority to pronounce judgment and the one who knows the future. He's the one that fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. I tell you, if these become quiet, the stones will cry out. And now, verse 41 to 44, he looks up, he sees Jerusalem, and he weeps. And he weeps. So let's talk about the king who weeps over his people. Our final point. The king who weeps over his people. Luke 19 verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and, and hem you in one every side, in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. There are a number of ways for weeping uh, in the scriptures. One of them, one of the Greek words is used in John uh, 11.35 of Erasmus, where it simply says, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible. That is, that is a simple word for weeping. But this in Luke is much stronger. It's a stronger word. In fact, this is the strongest word in the Greek language. It would be equal to our word of sobbing or heaving. Very strong. Agonizing. Sorrow. 
So Jesus sees Jerusalem and he's wrapped up with agony. He begins to heave, he begins to sow, he begins to weep. Why? Because he sees the future, because he knows all things, and he knows Friday is coming. What's going to happen on Friday? On Friday, the same people who are shouting out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The same people who are shouting out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The same people on Friday will be shouting out, Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. That's a lesson for us, isn't it? One day people will love you. One day people will speak all good things about you. They will praise you. One day you'll be the same people who will stab you. So he is agonized over their, super, uh, their superficial. He knows their hearts. You think he will be happy with his attention. You think he will be like, they finally get it. They know I am the Messiah. It looked good. They were saying the right words. They were doing the right things, taking off their clothes and putting it on the ground, submitting to him. They did the right things and they said the right things. But he could see through it. He wept in the face of their hypocritical state and their shallowness. He wept in their rejection. He knows Friday is coming. And he wept because he knew what would come after that. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, he says, verse 42. Not talking about peace with Rome, not talking about freedom from the, from the Roman hand, not talking about political peace, not talking about the eternal social peace. He's talking about peace with God. If you had only known if you had only known the things that make for peace. What makes for peace? Repentance. Faith in Christ. Believing the message of the kingdom. The message he had always been preaching. He preached the kingdom of God is at hand. From the very beginning, he preached repentance and the kingdom of God is at hand. <clears throat> he preached about how to come into the kingdom through faith in him. Repentance from sin. He'd been preaching it for three years. If you had only understood and believed in this incredible hour in which I have moved among you, if you had only believed the things that make for peace, the salvation message, that salvation language, peace with God, reconciliation, the gospel, but unbelief had blinded them all the way along. They chose to be unbelieving, hard-hearted, self-righteous, rejecters of Christ, rejecters of the truth. He gave them an invitation after an invitation, but they rejected them all. 
And therefore, they rejected peace, peace with God. And so the king weeps for them. And beloved, I would add, I would have you know today that the king weeps for you. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, you may be here this morning and in your hearts of hearts, deep down you have rejected Christ. You have been fooled and blinded by the God of this world with a small g. And you believe there's no God. I want you to know the king weeps for you. I weep for you. Because there's coming a time when Christ will return and he will judge the world. And those that reject him will be thrown in the lake of fire. In the fire that never stops burning. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me. You cast into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Nobody wants to hear those words. So I urge you, repent and turn to the Lord. For he is ready and willing to receive you. He wept when he saw Jerusalem because he knew Friday was coming. And so we will continue the story on Friday, 11 o'clock. Let us pray. Actually, let's have a time of open prayer. Maybe uh, a couple of you, a few of you pray out loud. And let's give God for this. Let's give God thanks for these things. And I will close us off in due time.